for the minute I was making my steps as every morning. In one minute, we got 10 babies born in the European Union. Usually they are five boys and five girls. The parents of a baby, be it a boy, be it a girl, wish the best for their lives. They want them to be happy, to fulfill their potential, because it's the future of the family. For the country, a member state, where a boy or a girl is born, they ensure that the life they will live, the education they will have, the occupations which they will be engaged in, and finally, retirement is the best. And they are the national identity of the country. They are their citizens. For the European Union, the European Union is the place where one of the best in the world framework, political environment, legal environment, is developed to ensure that every baby, a boy or a girl, who is born in the European Union will have equal possibilities, will grow, help us to grow, to develop the Europe we want to be. And if we look at the reality, what is the reality? What is the really chances of a, one of the five girls born a minute ago, or one of the four, five boys boy, bo, uh, bo, uh, born a minute ago? And what we see that the differences still are huge. If we take a boy who is born in a family of a migrant, parents, somebody who is non-AU, or as we say, foreign-born, we already know that he has very big chances that when he is grown up, when he has his education, he might land among the two million people men who are not employed today and never worked. For the girl on the other side, it's even worse. She might be among the six million who have never worked in their lives. And also for the girl, she knows that compared to a native born woman from one of the AU member states, she will be 46% more in, the, in that percentage of women who work, who work extremely much unpaid work because she has much more and twice as much as, let's say, a boy from a migrant background to care for children, to care for elderly, to care to have the work which is low paid and which is never valued enough. So if we take loan, if we take education, which we all are so proud of, we know that the girls outrun the boys in the highest level in the tertiary education. But if we look at low education, where are the risks? Where are the realities and differences between a boy and between a girl? A boy with a low education will always have a chance to develop the skills, to grow and be, let's say, working, get the job in the very men concentrated professions, engineering, construction, and he will still be able to run, uh, to make a career, uh, and maybe later finish the education. Whereas for a, for, a bo for a woman, for a girl, low education means really many dangers, not financial security, low pension, and all the possible, possible challenges we might feel. The family, we know that the more we want to have children, we want to have babies born, minute, this minute, next minute, because they are our future. But what does it mean for a woman to have a family? What does it mean for a woman to have children? We see it's not the same as for the father, because the more children a woman has, the more she loses in monthly earnings, the, more, the less chances she has to be in full-time work, to do the career, to train herself, to use the potential. Why? If we take single parents, so lone mothers, because you know that it is now new forms of formation we, we have, and we have many 
single parents. 85% of all of those single parents are women. And again, if you look at what <coughs> do they have to sacrifice, when they are born, they don't know about this. But then life, reality, brings more and more things which are losing because of norms, because of the type of family, because of the society we are. Realities for women and men today are really different. Sixty years ago, we all know, the Treaty of Rome established gender equality as the principle, as the fundamental principle of the European Union. And where are we now? We are walking snail's pace. Is that enough? Is that what we want? Sixty years, it is too long for us to say that we have a baby born, knowing that now, the moment, I know that if it is she, she will face very many challenges, because if it is she, if it is he, I might maybe sit more calm and know that my baby will have the future he deserves. We are doing now, we are working very much with new initiatives, the social pillar, the soon we will have, and also the, the, the work-life balance initiative, which is to the right direction. I imagine soon we will start discussing what, we, what will happen after Europe 2020 is finished. Can we afford having new strategies without those gaps and challenges being tackled? Is it right? Is that the way we want to go? So then, when a baby wakes up, the first thing you say, why you are a girl, or why you are a boy, we have to act now. The snail space is not enough, because we have women and men who are our citizens, who are our future, and they have to have equal chances and equal possibilities. So our index is about showing everybody where those gaps are, which are details of the things we can do and how we can change the Europe, the future of Europe, how we can make this growth really, as we counted, 3.15 trillion of, dollar, uh, of euros we can get if we put all those gaps, close them, and we give the equal chances and opportunities. So let's hear today what we can do to make our Europe best in the world. Thank you very much to Virginia for this opening note. Virginia is the director of AIGE. We can also call her the founder of AIGE and definitely the, the spirit and soul of AIGE. My name is Mira Banerjee. I'm the head of communications at AIGE. And my name is Edith Stoll. I'm an editor at the Austrian Broadcasting uh, Union, and I will guide you through this day. We would also like to welcome you, everybody here in the room. We are very pleased to see such a full house here today. We had all together 338 registered participants, which is uh, pretty much how much we can fit in this room. We've got people from 38 countries, from all and every single 28 EU member states, and, and also from, from 10 other countries, which we are very, very happy about. Uh, but things are happening also outside of this room, so, so we are also web streaming the event. So welcome also to all of you who are watching us in, in the um, cyberspace. Um, and uh, we will also be tweeting about this event, we will be doing live uh, posting on the Facebook, so whoever is active can, can also join us outside of, of what's happening here. Um, now, we are very, very happy first of all, to see all of you here and to share this day with you. We are also very pleased to see that we've got the commitment of, of the very top level of the European institutions from those rooms where decisions regarding gender equality are made. And we would like to open the day with, with two opening statements. First, I would like to invite on stage uh, Commissioner, European Commissioner for Justice, Consumers and Gender Equality, Mrs. Vera Jourova. Please, can you join us here? 
Uh, we've been very happy to have her as our commissioner because despite her very broad profile, she's shown a very human perspective to, to all the areas that she's working on. And uh, we've seen a big commitment to gender equality. And especially close to her heart during these years have been focused on, on violence against women, on gender pay gap, and uh, empowering, empowering women out of poverty, which are all issues that we will, we will be tackling today in the context of the Gender Equality Index. Commissioner Jourova, please. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this event. Uh, and thank you for telling me that this is web streamed because I was just ready to get upset and to be passionate, which uh, sometimes uh, seems to be a little bit ridiculous when you do not share the same atmosphere. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, it will happen to me here because uh, we are going to speak about the gender index uh, today, uh, which uh, has uh, been elaborated and the data measured by AGE. Thank you very much, Madam Virginia, you do a great job because we need, and, and uh, where are the people from AGE, by the way? Thank you very much. You are becoming a real European hub for gender equality, and I think this was high time to, to have it. And it's also high time to have the proper data to look into the eyes of the truth and to decide to do maybe a few things in a different way. Because what we see in the figures, uh, the situation has not uh, been uh, uh, for the better in, in the last few years. I am disappointed. I am shocked in some cases because I think that uh, it showed, shows clearly that we, as I said, we do something wrong and we do not consider, recognize that we have this problem in several member states of the EU. In several member states, they have recognized it some years ago and they have good results, and it is shown also, among other areas, on economy. I'm looking at Madam Minister Osha from Sweden, and I think uh, she will come with good news from Sweden. Thank you for that also. Uh, we need to work with facts, and we need to do it in spite of the sad truths that um, According to many, many people who grasp where we are in Europe, we, I am afraid we live in post-truth and post-factual reality. I watched recently an interview in Czech television between the Czech uh, social and labor, uh, labor uh, affairs uh, minister, Misha Marksova, and a gentleman who is now even the, the candidate for the president of the Czech Republic. And she was equipping him with so many facts and figures. We spoke about gender equality. He had full nose in it. All the very relevant data and facts. And his response was ridiculing the problem, diminishing the problem, not, he didn't say, I do not believe the facts. He was not ready to work with the facts, to, 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 to have a discussion on it. And his response was, uh, it's just another, sorry to say it, stupid invention from the EU that we have such problem. Yeah, so I am always rather, I feel awkward when I, uh, criticize something from my own country, which I love from the bottom of my heart. But this really made me very upset. I, I read recently that this gentleman uh, had some punishment at home that his wife prohibited him to smoke at home. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Kuberova. <laughs> now I'm happy it's web streamed. Uh, well, I have a very, very nice political speech here, but I guess you would like to hear some information, don't you? So, uh, 
what we do, uh, first of all, we speak too much and, and we speak everywhere uh, about the same things. And I'm really, after doing this agendas for three years, I am quite tired of repeating all those, all those problems. Well, we should stop speaking about the problems and look into uh, how to achieve better results because we are too much process oriented. I'm convinced about that. That's why we are changing a little bit also the way of working with this agenda in the Commission, coming with several, uh, not leg pieces of legislation, but policies. I will illustrate, illustrate it on the Work-Life Balance Initiative. You know that we withdrew the Maternity Leave Directive because it didn't say anything else than how many weeks and how much money. And we knew we have to do something much wider, something more comprehensive, something which will touch upon the structural problems we have. And we have two, two problems, uh, that uh, the burden is simply only on women, and we need the men to participate also. And at the same time to leave it on the families, how they organize it. I am not a social engineer who will dictate the families how to live. That's all, that has been always my position. But to open the choice for the families and to steer a bit the men and to, to, in, in, to come with incentives for the men to participate more. And the second systemic problem we, we have is the, are the unfavorable, uh, unfavorable, infavorable, what is it? Working conditions for the women. Now in modern era, in, in digital era, I think that there are many more possibilities for smart combining work and, and uh, private life uh, by using the modern technologies. The third systemic problem we see is the lack of investments into the social services and social infrastructure. And this is all we wanted to capture by the Work-Life Balance Initiative, which is combination of legislative proposals. You know, we are introducing paternity leave. Uh, we are introducing changes in parental leave with the incentives for the men to, to participate more. Uh, we are uh, pay, paying more attention to smart country-specific recommendations tar targeted to the concrete countries. We are pushing on more investments into social services, also by using the European uh, Development Fund uh, in the countries where they have this kind of uh, massive funding. Again, economy. When you look at how these things are developing, these policies, how, how they fly or not fly, uh, I, we see that we need to use more economic figures and facts. And of course it is unfair when an educated, university educated woman has to make that horrible choice whether to choose the career or having children. But it's unfair, but unfairness, I, I realize this will not work enough. So we use for this work-life balance very good data and economical figures, which should, and I, I'm convinced about that, which should convince also the member states to come and adopt this work-life balance, these legislative proposals and the non-legislative measures, because simply they must see that it will be good for the economy of the state. This is where we are. But I think there is nothing wrong to work with the economic data. But uh, we should also remind ourselves that this is unfair to keep the inequality in, in such an important uh, area. I'm afraid I speak too long, wasn't it? Meant to be 10 minutes only. Five minutes? Uh, we will follow the same uh, philosophy uh, in our action plan uh, against pay, uh, gender pay gap. We will publish it in November. Again, it might be the combination of legislative and many, many non-legislative measures. We want to do it as a result-oriented thing. 
based on a very good analysis of the sources of the pay gap. And it's not a trivial phenomenon at all, because we see segregated jobs, and the index shows it very well. Uh, the source which uh, stems from discrimination, uh, the source which stems from uh, a low self-confidence of the women and girls themselves, it's, it's a combination of many, many factors. And we have analyzed these factors and we are addressing them one by one. You will see, and I hope there will be some, some public consultation. Monica, Irena, uh, yes? So please follow, follow what we do on this, on this pay gap action, action plan. Uh, we focus a lot this year on violence against women. Uh, the figures we have are shocking. We see new figures here. Uh, again, in many or some member states, uh, they have not recognized we have a problem. This issue is also very difficult and complex one because, again, it is not enough to prohibit it. Well, violence against women is prohibited. It is a criminal offense. It's, it's a crime which should be tackled by law enforcement authorities. And, of course, helping victims, which is from the same sphere of criminal justice. But we need to change the mindset of people in Europe. We need to change the thinking of the society which in some part of Europe and in some part of the society the people think, well, it's normal to beat the wife. It's a kind of socially accepted. It has always been here. The men have physical dominance, so they simply use it. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Well, we still are in Europe. I always say European Union is a, is a good address for women, but when you look at the figures illustrating violence against women, we, we see that uh, uh, we are not there at all. So uh, we are running the campaign. We will continue to do so. We will push member states to ratify Istanbul Convention, which we already uh, where well, we already uh, acceded to uh, from the side of the EU, and we uh, will continue uh, influencing the, the societies not to take violence against women as something which is socially acceptable, because it is not. And we also work uh, against uh, uh, online uh, hate speech, which is also massively targeted against girls and women. Uh, I have many, many more information here, but I don't want to steal this conference. <laughs> uh, we, have at, we have ahead of us a lot of common work. If we manage to all work in the same direction, focusing on the results, taking the right measures into our hands, and working with the facts and figures, which we have also today from EGE, we must have better results and some success stories in a course of several years. I truly believe in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Jourova. There we heard already some commitments, so this is a very good start of the day on, on how to take forward the, the results of the index. Now, our next opening statement comes from uh, Mr. Dimitris Papadimoulis. He's a Vice President of the European Parliament. Please join us on the stage. He's got a background in business world as well as in, in politics, both in his home country, Greece, and, and then at the European level. So maybe he will tell us a little bit on, on, on how the economic perspective play, plays in, in, the, in the gender equality. I would also like to say that the European Parliament is a very supportive partner to EGE, has always been, and we are extremely pleased to have commitment on, on this very high level. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear colleagues, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in the opening of, the, of that event. I think that AG is doing a very good job on uh, gender equality. <clears throat> and uh, I'm happy to fully agree with uh, Commissioner Eurovas 
uh, approach and proposal. The figures are presenting um, a reality which is far back from our targets. We made some progress in comparison with 2005, but the progress is too small according to the needs and in comparison to our founding values. The European Parliament, as an employer, plays, plays a large, places a large emphasis on gender equality, particularly in decision making and in a female representation in management posts. If you see the clear political level, we have almost 50% of female presidents of political groups, more than 40% female presidents of uh, committees. If you see the administration, things are worse. If you see the middle management, the presence of women is sufficient. But if you see the high level management, things are much worse than in the middle management. And it's up to us to cover that gap. Uh, as the vice president of the parliament responsible for gender equality and diversity, and as chair of the bureau's high level group on that subject is, it is my role to continue to steer Parliament's policies in this field. A number of priorities have been charted within the Secretariat General aiming at promoting full equality in every aspect of working life and fostering an open, inclusive working environment for women and men alike. In pursuit of that vision, I presented on behalf of the high-level group of gender equality and diversity a report entitled Gender Equality in the European Parliament Secretariat, State of Play and the Way Forward 2017-2019 until the end of our mandate, which the Bureau adopted on January 2017 unanimously. And that report outlines a number of measures and practical steps of, for implementation and creates a roadmap for things to be done. And the high level group monitors that process. And I fully agree with the commissioner that's now up to us to ch check, to push to see real practical results and achievements in the next index. Not only to speak and to give perfect speeches about our founding values, about gender equality and so on, but to fight against stereotypes and to use the best European practices, like the Swedish example, that I'm sure that it would be presented from the minister in order to diminish, to cover that gap. I think that that index is very important because it is focusing based on data, based on numbers in five major remarks. A, the current score for gender equality in the EU is 66.2 out of 100. It's a big gap for our goals. B, employment access and opportunities are particularly low for women with disabilities and women with low qualifications. C, limited work-life balance affects women with children, 
the gender equal societies and are more open towards future generations. And E, gender equal societies are more inclusive societies. There is much room for improvement and it is thus critical the concept of equality to be taught and become something that we learn from our earliest years at home, at school, and at work, but also something we learn through workshops and awareness campaign implemented in daily life. The European Parliament must be 100% committed to equality, more than it really does now. It must be a staunch advocate of principles and measures for making full gender equality part of individual consciousness and routine practice in line with the EU treaties and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. This conference on the Gender Equality Index 2017 is an effective means of raising awareness about this issue and highlighting achievements, the stakeholders involved, and the challenges to be tackled. Women, in order to be on a com completely equal footing with men, need to make the cells themselves indispensable to the success of the European project. Fusing and strengthening our democratic foundations guarantees equalities, fairness, and social justice. There is a lot of work to be done, and we have to do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Now, now we have um, set the scene. Now we know where, how the European institutions are, are thinking about gender equality and why we are here today. Now, if this would be a theatre performance at this point, well, at the very latest at this point, you would be asked to mo switch off your mobile phones and devices and, and all of that. But we are not in theatre. This is real life and this is gender equality. And we want to do this together with you. So for that reason, we'd like to engage you in this discussion. And since we are so many in the room, it's not very easy. So we are using technology to help us. And now what I would like you to do is to, to take your mobile phones, uh, turn on internet, and um, either the Wi-Fi or, or allow the roaming. And then you should uh, open your browser and uh, type there slido.com. It's very simple. And once you are there, you would just write the code there, hashtag EGA index, as you see there on the screen. This is something that we will be using throughout the day. You, you see there are two tabs. One is for questions and one is for polls. And for the questions at any time during the conference, you can type in your question to the panel. And you can also like questions, what, which others have posted, like you do in Facebook. You do the th thumbs up. And my colleague here will be moderating and seeing which questions are, are being very popular and, and, and seen as important to raise. And as many as we can, we will then ask to the panel. We will not be able to ask all of them, but, but we will do as much as time allows. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is the, the polls. So we'll do a few polls. And uh, now, since the excitement is, is coming to, to the very high le highest level, since we are about to release the results of the Gender Equality Index 2017, we would like to do a little polling for you. So please choose the poll tab, and you will see a question there. Which EU country has improved the most in gender equality index over the past 10 years? What, would, what, what is your best guess that you see? All the EU member states there on the listed, listed in, on the screen. You may need to scroll down a little bit to see exactly everything. And then you can give your opinion on which country you think has, has made the biggest progress in 10 years. And here we are seeing on the screen how, how it's coming up. So the top vote is, is for Sweden. And then we've got Italy, Estonia, Malta, Spain, Finland, Germany, top five so far. Sweden is a very, very strong candidate here in, in this vote. Okay, we take up to 90 and then, then okay, we're over 90 now. Okay, 
So this is this is what the what the audience thinks, and, and we are very soon about to find out how how it is actually in the index. Eddie, do you want to do you want to take on for the for the first panel of the day? <laughs> 